and uh, God uses them. And uh, his name means Jehovah comforts. So when you are talking with or about Jeremiah, you are going to get some comfort. I would like to liken this man, Jeremiah, to a missionary. A missionary is somebody that lives captive to sin until God saves him. And we see that in this place, in, um, in Shushan, the palace, this young man, I don't know if the number 20 that is mentioned in there is about his age or how long he's been serving the king as a cup bearer, but he says that's 20 years. And uh, as, as we go up to the, to the first chapter, uh, it says over there, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislew in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. Now, we know by history that uh, Nehemiah was a captive. He was born in captivity. So I don't know if it was the 20 years that he had served the king or 20 years that he's his age. I don't know. But I know that he was in the palace. Now, you talk about the palace and you talk about comfort. You talk about... Uh, not really having a great need of anything until God touches your heart. When God touches your heart, it is almost impossible to ignore it. We have over here a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful story, the beginning of this book of Nehemiah, and uh, it, it, it says that he wasn't there. Now, I put myself in that place, and I, I don't see that much of a need of anything. He was serving the king. Now, to serve the king, you had to be a little bit of a uh, entertainer, if you will. You had to be a good reader. You had to be a, uh, a person that uh, understands certain things and I see in Nehemiah all these things coming to, to pass. He was a, uh, a good man. Uh, and this good man was serving the king. The king, he was giving him, and at, at the end of chapter 1, verse 11, it says, For I was the king's cupbearer. Now, that, I believe, it is a, um, a very uh, good position to be in because while you know that you are a captive, you really need nothing because everything that the, that the king has, you can say that's yours. And uh, uh, this man, I like because he was, he, he has the, uh, the, uh, the wood to make a missionary. He was in there, he was uh, in, in Shushan the palace, until one day, verse 2 says, that Hanani, one of my brethren. One thing that I like about this, uh, the Bible, is that mentions people with the relationship that exists with them. When you open the Bible and you see how God's people talk to each other, they don't go like the world does. The, uh, the people of God go to each other with that respect Without, uh, without love, if you will. Because the, it says that if the love of the Father is not in you, you are not really in the light. 
you are kind of missing it. So we have over here this man, Hanani, and he recognized that he is a brethren. He is one of the Jews that came and uh, begins to talk to him. Not only him, but, but it says that certain other men of Judah and asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped. They were no longer enslaved. They were going back to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was in a very, very precarious condition. You know, that is what a missionary answers the call for. We are going to go see people who are not well, who are in, in need of many things, and we, by a touch of God, we begin to see what we can do about it. So these people that had escaped the, the captivity, they were concerned about Jerusalem. It says over here in verse 3, and they said unto me, now we can see that Nehemiah's, or Nehemiah is the, um, the author of the book. And he says that they came to him and he, they told him something. And uh, they made him know a need. A missionary normally responds to a need. A missionary normally answers the call that God puts in his heart. And if you have somebody that is a missionary, you will see that that's exactly how they react. So we have this man, Nehemiah, and uh, he is talking with people that came from Jerusalem looking for him and uh, to tell them something that was in their hearts. They had a burden. I don't know about you, but each one of us has a burden. If you do not have a burden, uh, there's something wrong because you are not in communication with God. God lets you know what he wants you to know if you are in communication with him. So we have this situation where Nehemiah was a man of prayer, and we see that, uh, that while he was in, in, the, in the captivity in, the, in that province, they came and told him that the Jews are in a very, very broken down city, to the point that the, the the doors that hold the city were burned with fire. I don't know what that means with a, in, in, in literature, but if it's not burned with fire, what it would be burned with, you know? So we, we say that, uh, and, and, and the book says that they were broken down and burned with fire. That means that they were beyond repair. And the people in there, they had no idea of how to accomplish that. So, verse 4, it begins something that every missionary goes through. It says in verse 4, and it came to pass when I heard these words. When we hear that there are people all over the world in need, what happens in your heart? What happens in your mind? When we hear missionaries that come over here and they say there are millions and millions of people in here and there, and how many Baptist churches? 30. And there's not, there's not that much of a demand, I guess, for a church in any place. But as missionaries and as a missionary that I am at heart 
I want to go and help. I want to live today if I could. My calling is not over. My calling to be a missionary has not been lifted up. The book of Romans says the gifts of God are without repentance. He, he never takes it away. And uh, there is one verse in, um, in Ecclesiastes that says that we are in a war. And this war, there's no retirement. So we have to keep on going until the Lord takes us home. So in here we see that it came to pass that when he heard these words, I sat down and wept. Have you been there? Have you had enough uh, motivation in your heart that tells you this is real sad and something crushes your heart and squeezes your heart and somebody has said that when God squeezes your heart tears flow down. That is, in a song that says, that is the language that God understands. When you are able to cry, when you are able to feel, when you are able to, to, to comprehend the dismay that these people are in, and you begin to feel it, you begin to empathize, if you will, Something inside of you tears you up. I hate to know that the people in Ecuador are still. There's only one church that I know exists, and I know that the one that I left in there. Now, I know that there are other churches. Or they call themselves churches. But to me, a church is a place where sick situations or sick spiritual people come in in order to get help in their situation, in their spiritual needs. The church is a uh, spiritual hospital or a spiritual clinic, whatever you want to call it. But this thing that when we hear something and we are able to sit down and weep and mourn, not for a day, for a couple, couple of minutes. It says over here for certain days. That means a long time. When you are concerned about something and you don't worry about it anymore, the burden has been lifted up. It's not your burden anymore. But over here we see that this man, for certain days, he was concerned. He was moved. He, 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 was, he was taken by God and showed him that there is a great, great need. Nehemiah knew that there was a need. And uh, what does a missionary do when that takes place? Begins to pray. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. It says over here that not only he prayed, he was so serious about the situation of Jerusalem that he actually fasted and prayed. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said when the disciples came in and they said, we couldn't do anything with this guy. I mean, we couldn't get the demons out of him. So he looked at them and says, this comes only by Praying and fasting. So this idea of praying and fasting, it's not a New Testament situation. It's something that has come from the Old Testament. See, all these things are known. But because of the lack of usage, people do not care. And we need to go back to it. In Jeremiah says that we have to look for the old paths. 
We need to see that we are able to identify with those things that God has taught us. Peter says, I will never, I will never be neglectful. And I always remind you of these things that not that you do not know, but that you know and you need to practice. You need to do what God says to do. So this man sat down, wept for a few days, and uh, fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. That's awesome. That is what I, uh, like Brother G was saying, uh, he was laying down and the lights went on, and, and I don't want to see anything I don't want to see, man. But when you are deep in prayer, that is what, there is when God touches your heart. When you are praying, when you are in, in, in that particular time, he says, I beseech you. You have heard that word beseech. It is used in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's what the Bible says. And over here in Jeremiah, excuse me, in Nehemiah, we see that particular situation taking place. He says, I beseech thee, O God of heaven, just like the prayer, the disciple prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven. Exactly the same thing. It says, O God, Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. Yes, he is terrible because he loves us. People say, but I am not a sinner. Yes, you are. I wasn't there when Adam and Eve sinned. Yes, you were. And we know that these things take place. And God is so terribly loving to us. You see, that's another term, or a term that we can turn it around. And says, He's terribly loving to us. And he's a terrible God and that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. What a, what a prayer. He is making or repeating something that God has already given to him. He is the God of heaven. He's a terrible God. And he keep covenant. He keep his word. He keep that which is given to us so that we can understand him. <clears throat> he is a, 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 a God of covenant. He is merciful to them that love him. And observe his commands. In the book of Nahum, in chapter 1, verse 7, he says, God is good. And, and just for the heck of it, I, I want you to read that part. It, it's so good. Because in the book of Nahum, it's a, uh, it, it shows exactly what the, um, what the wrath of God can be. And uh, after, the, after Micah, you go one over, and that's where Nehemiah, I mean, uh, Nahum is. If you take that, it says, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Koshite. And from that to verse 6, men, it says, who stands before the, his, who stands before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? He is he's very powerful. Verse 7 to me is an, an island of solace, it, an, an island of, of peace. 
It says, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he know them that trust in him. Ain't that some? When we see over here Nehemiah going through these things, he understands that God is a terrible God, but he keeps his, his, his covenant and he's merciful and he loves us and he loves us in that way because we belong to him. Then he continues his prayer in verse 6 and says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open. Now, that, that, that to me is, a, is, a, is an overstating, but that is how, how, how much thrust he's putting in his prayer. Let your let your ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned. Notice that he doesn't exclude himself. Notice that when one in this nation sins, the whole nation is responsible for it. And we know that. And, and I love what the Brother Gene is always saying. Let's pray for our nation. Our nation is a beautiful nation. It's the best nation in the world. It's a nation that, that everybody is envious of it. We have a beautiful, beautiful country. It's so beautiful that people are beginning to tear it down because they are jealous. He says that, Brother Gene says, that he is an American. And uh, not everybody that lives in America is an American. But he is an American, and so am I, by choice. Remember that some people are Americans by accident, by birth, and birth is an accident that happened to be in America. But to us, the foreigners, we come over here, we understand the beauty of this country, how God has thrown his grace on thee, and now, we are graceful people that we know that there is a God and this God is the one that loves us. And Brother Jesus, we have to pray for our country. Yes, we have to. Like Nehemiah, pray for Jerusalem. We have to pray for America. America is my country. And like I said, not by accident, but by choice. On the 31st of December of 1968, I swore the flag of the United States and I became an American citizen. One thing that I will never, never repent. There are people that leave the country because they do not want to be in America. Fine, go, good riddance. But we need to pray for this country just like Nehemiah with that heart of a missionary is trying to reach those ones that they are in distress. In distress. Let your ear now be attentive. Lord, listen to us. Heal our land. Convict us of sin. Like Brother Chuck says, his hand presses me sore. We need to feel that. We need to feel that we are not just people or humans. We are Americans. And Americans have pride. Not proud enough to reject like the people of the Laodicea and do. Now we have riches and we have everything. We do not need for anything. 
No, we need God. And this God is the one that is going to open his eyes, open his ears, and are going to listen to our prayer, which now we are praying before him. I know that my co-patriots, people that are Americans, do not feel these things because they don't want to. And then is when we come in. We have to pray for these people that they think that they are Americans, they are living of the fat of the land over here, and they are not doing anything about being a, a supportive force for this country. He recognizes, Nehemiah recognizes that we have sinned. And that sin is the one that we are trying to confess. We are trying to say, Lord, help us in these particular things that we have that we need to repent of this sin. Why? Because we know that we have sinned. Repentance comes only through knowledge. If you have no knowledge, you have nothing to repent. And that's why Jesus came from heaven and he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, in verse 20, it says that God, knowing that the Gentiles have not received all the oracles of God, they were not responsible. But once the gospel was given to them, they became responsible. And that is what happens to each one of us. When we know that we need to do good and we do not do good, James says that that is sin. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God is listening and is hearing and is looking upon us because he wants to repent of all those things that we have sinned against him. A sin is not only against each other. The sin is against God. And that is where God touches your heart and makes you confess these things. Verse 7 says, we have, dwelt, we have dealt very corruptly against thee. Now, I don't know about you, but this book just speaks to everybody. And as a missionary, we are taking this particular message to people who are in need. We need to let them know that we have dealt corruptly. We do not have all the things we don't have our old ducks in a row. We are sinful people. And by God's grace, some of us have gotten saved by the hand of the Lord. And then it's when he touches us and makes us realize there are people out there that need what you have. I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, I can go forever with this particular thing. And I do want to let you know that Nehemiah was a missionary. Nehemiah prayed. Nehemiah fasted. Nehemiah is our example. I am glad that God is not making examples of us now because there would be nobody to be an example. But God has made Nehemiah an example for us, and he pleads with us, please, 
do what God says. Let's be obedient and let's give him the glory. And like I said, I can go forever with this particular uh, text, but thank you for being such a good listeners. And I pray that uh, God will guide you home safely. And I'll see you again on Wednesday. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for Nehemiah. Thank you for that spirit of missions that laid in him. Father, we love you. And we pray that uh, as Nehemiah pray, let your ears and your eyes and everything that is in you help us to become better for your glory and for your pleasure. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Any questions?